Hi, everyone. This is a, I think it's a record-breaking audience. Uh, it's partly to be nice, I say that, but I think it's probably close to be true. I guess quite a few. Uh, welcome. Um, today, our guest is Professor Michaela Fandra, who's with us here in the Environmental Studies and Geology Division since um, August. So, very exciting. Um, Michaela has a BA in Geoscience from Wellsville, Wellesley College, and, it, and not Wellsville, <laughs> nothing against Wellsville, but Wellesley College, and a BA in Astronomy, so double degree, double major, double major, uh, and a PhD in Paleoclimate from a, a joint program of MIT and the Woods Hole Institute of uh, Oceanography, or the Woods Hole Oceanog Oceanographic Institution. I think I got it right. Um, she then worked as an NSF-funded postdoctoral fellow at University at Buffalo. Uh, in this week's feature of Found in Her Resume, um, she was a member in good standing of the Boston Cyclists Union. And, um, <laughs> and she was on the, the MIT cycling uh, racing team as well. So I'm going to pass it on. To, and it's not about cycling today. So this different, different type of cycling. Different kind of cycling. Just to be totally upfront, due to COVID, I never actually raced. I was on the team, but I didn't actually race. <laughs> so as Fred said, um, he actually got ahead of a lot of the stuff I was going to say about myself. So it's his fault that I'm being re repetitive. But I'm Michaela. I just started here in August. I'm a professor of geology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what's to come today? I'm going to give you some background on me uh, and how I chose the science that I do. I'll then tell you about sort of broad goals of my science, uh, what I'm trying to do with my many different projects. Then I'll t give you some background on the Bering Strait. That's what you're going to be hearing about today. So I'll give you what you need, hopefully, to take something out of this talk. And then I'll tell you about my work with the Bering Strait, so my actual research. So as Fred said, I double majored in astronomy at geosci in geosciences at Wellesley College. Uh, that's me in the yellow hat in the front. That's a geology field trip that we took to New Mexico. Um, I actually started my undergraduate degree in the astrophysics department. Um, I didn't enjoy studying gas and dust, so I switched to geology. No offense to those who still study gas and dust. Almost all of my undergraduate research was about Mars. So when I graduated, I took a pretty big pivot because I was really interested in the Earth um, and specifically the Earth's climate. So as I say often, I live down here. After graduation, I was actually a research assistant for two years at Woods Hole Oceanographic. So that's me off to collect some water from a dock in New Bedford. Um, during that time, I wrote code, and I sampled water. So I went out on boats, often I was on docks. If you're an undergraduate who's interested in grad school, but you're not ready yet, this is a really good option. Um, I got a lot of experience doing research. I was exposed to a lot of different types of research, and it was also very fun. So um, if you're interested in being a research assistant, you can talk to me about what that's like. I then did my PhD in the MIT HUI joint program. We call it HUI because it's hard to say the whole thing. Um, I'm not going to talk about this research at all, but know that it was about icebergs, how they carry sediment, and the impact of how they carry sediment on how we interpret um, records of climate and so on and so forth through geologic time. Um, I then graduated. <laughs> So my research interests, going from less specific to more specific, are climate change. Um, I'm interested specifically, though, in climate change of the past. So I say I like to study the climate, change, the climate of the past because it already happened, so it's not sad. Um, how changes in the ocean produce changes in climate is really the impetus of my research. I'm interested in these climate-ocean connections, and that's mostly what you're going to hear about today. Um, the climate and oceans, they're sort of one and the same. Um, using computer models of Earth systems is what I do to better understand these connections. So past oceans, past climate, and the modern world, I use computer models, I wrote code, to better understand these connections. 
So why study climate? Um, if you need convincing, here it is. So uh, this is a picture from Hurricane Maria, in or after Hurricane Maria in 2017 in Puerto Rico. Uh, this was above average storm in terms of intensity and destruction. Uh, this is a wildfire in California in 2020. You might remember these fires. They burned for much longer than they have historically because of how dry it was and how much, how little precipitation there was. Um, more close to my home, this is a picture of the Boston Seaport District. Uh, that is a fire truck driving through uh, flooding water. It's seawater and with snow on top. So Virtually every year now, the seaport district of Boston floods during major storms. This is a regular occurrence. And these are all examples of people's day-to-day -day relationships with climate change. Each of these natural disasters, its intensity is attributed to climate change. So it's happening right now, and people are experiencing it in their day-to-day -day lives. If you want a more broad global picture, this is uh, change in global temperature since 1880. So about 1880 is when people tend to think of the start of global climate change. It's a pretty dramatic plot. I don't need to describe it too much to you, but it's getting hotter, and it has been for some time. Relatedly, um, ice globally has been dropping by about 13% each decade. Um, this is only going back to about 1980, um, so keep that in mind. And on the subject of those axes, uh, our records of temperature actually go back quite far. Farmers, uh, sailors, all these people, they tend to keep pretty good records of temperature. So we have records that go back farther. But as I said, human-made climate change is only really thought to have started about 1880. Uh, global ice volume is a more difficult problem. You kind of need a satellite in order to get at it. So that's why this plot only goes back to about 1980, is because that's when we started to be able to measure global ice. So modern climate, it's changing currently. The science is settled, OK? Data about this change, though, only go back about 200 years. We're only at the very beginning of climate change. So it's difficult, actually, to get at this problem to predict what will happen because we've only had 200 years of experience, which is a geologic instant. So what do we need to do? We need more, more data about climate change. But like I said, using the case of modern climate change, we only have 200 years of data. So what I do is I look to the past. The Earth's climate has changed many times throughout its history for various reasons. Um, so if you're looking for more data about climate change, you have to look to the past. And that's what I do. I study paleo climate, the climate of the past. This is a brief schematic of how we go about doing that. So you have some sort of climate signal in the past, OK? Precipitation, temperature, ice volume, what have you. That climate signal is recorded in a paleoclimate archive something like tree rings, ice cores, sediment cores, any number of things. You make a measurement on that paleoclimate archive of a paleoclimate proxy. This is usually a chemical measurement. And then from that measurement, you're able to make an interpretation of a climate signal. So this is a dotted line because it is an interpretation. People are really good at this, okay? You can say with a good amount of confidence what exactly your climate signal is, but your geochemical measurement isn't going to say it was 30 degrees, okay? Your geochemical measurement is going to say there was more oxygen 18 compared to 16. And you, as a scientist, need to interpret what that means. We're good at this, but it's difficult. And it can be made easier or less uncertain by using a forward model of a geologic process. So when I say model, I mean a computer model. There are many different versions of this, um, each addressing a different connection in this paleoclimate study flow. But this is what I do. And I apply these methods at multiple points. I use uh, many different models. If you were at this seminar a couple weeks ago, Rebecca Topness talked about a lake model. I use that model quite a bit. I actually wrote a piece of it. But today, I'm going to be telling you about global models. So these are larger scale computer models 
that simulate climate and oceans as a whole. So now we're getting into the specifics, the Bering Strait project. I want to manage your expectations, okay? This is a new project. You're, you're he hearing just about the beginning of it. So you're not gonna leave this lecture hall feeling like you understand everything about the Bering Strait and its connection to climate. I hope you'll understand it better, but you're mostly gonna walk away with a better idea of the next steps we need to take to better understand this connection. Hope that's okay. So the Bering Strait, here it is. So that's Russia, that's Alaska. This tiny little channel here with a couple islands in the middle, that's the Bering Strait. Now that we know where it is, let's zoom in a bit. So there it is, okay? Again, Alaska, Siberia. These are the Diomede, I think it's pronounced, islands. There's actually settlement on those. People live there. The Bering Strait is only about 82 kilometers wide, okay? And importantly, it's only about 52 meters deep. To give you some context, it's closer from here to Rochester than it is from, a, or it's closer for across the Bering Strait than it is from here to Rochester. If you could drive across the ocean, you could make it to Siberia from Alaska in less time than it would take you to get to Rochester. My apologies to those of you who live in Rochester. <laughs> Stepping out a bit, I wanna give you a bit more of a global context for the ocean. This is called the Global Ocean Conveyor. It's driven by differences, differences of temperature and salinity. So gradients of temperature and gradients of salinity cause the ocean to flow in this global manner. This circulation also transports heat, okay? So the tropics closer to the equator, they receive more sunlight, so they're hotter. The poles get less sunlight, so they're colder. That's why there's ice there. The ocean works to mute those differences. If the ocean didn't flow, we would have a very different climate than we have now. If the ocean flowed differently, we would also have a very different climate than we have now. So we're now to drive that point home, we're gonna look at this part of this circulation. This is the Atlantic branch of the global ocean conveyor, um, known as the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or to its friends, AMOC. So the blue line is the strength of that conveyor or the strength of that current. And the red line is an average temperature for the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see this major ocean current, AMOC, blue line, how strong it is, and the temperature of the ocean it flows through are extremely linked. You can't have you can't change one without changing the other, okay? These, the flow of this current and the climate of the ocean and the world, by extension, are linked. So, as I just said, because oceans transport heat, they're fundamental to climate. Oceans are really a part of our climate system. They're not a separate sphere, really. I don't like to think of them that way. The oceans and the climate go together. So I said that this current is driven by differences of temperature and salinity, but it's shaped by where the continents are. Water can't flow over the land. So where the contents are, continents are, to some extent, determines where this ocean flows. This connectivity is important. This point is really driven home if we look up in the Arctic. So this uh, map cuts off this flow in the Arctic, but that's not really what happens. This is really what happens. So this is the North Atlantic here coming into the Arctic, swirls around, we have gyres, um, we have the exchange of heat, we have the exchange of fresh and salty water. This is a pretty complicated story, okay? And how this flow, especially in the, excuse me, in the Arctic, is really important for climate, as I've said. What I want you to look at specifically in this figure though, is this, that tiny blue arrow, arrow coming in from the Pacific Ocean into the Arctic, that's the Bering Strait. The Bering Strait is the only direct connection from the Pacific Ocean to the Arctic. So any water exchange that's directly happening from the Pacific to the Arctic has to come through the Bering Strait. 
This is made even more complicated because we're thinking about many times in Earth his Earth's history. This is a plot of sea level through time, so x-axis, time in thousands of years, y-axis, sea level. Modern sea levels right there, this dotted line, and this big black line is sea level through Earth history. For the last 20,000 years or so, sea level has generally speaking been lower than it is now. Only during the last full interglacial, 120,000 years ago, was sea level deeper than it is now. What I want you to keep in mind, or what's important about this, is that the Bering Strait is only 52 meters deep. So at any point where sea level is below this line, the Bering Strait is land. Water's not getting through it. Bering Strait is closed. Anywhere above that, the Bering Strait's shallower, okay? It doesn't have the 50 meters of, deep, it's or of depth, it's shallower. So when we talk about the Bering Strait, and we say it's small, you know, it's only 82 kilometers across, it's only 52 meters deep. This is very, very important, okay? That's a really important point that this is such a tiny body of water. This channel punches well above its weight in terms of its climate importance because it is the only connection between the Pacific and the Arctic. And because it's so small, is really vulnerable to change depending on sea level. Okay, so just to give you some context with the modern Bering Strait. Flow through the Bering Strait is about one sphere drop. This is an oceanography unit. It means one million cubic meters per second. Flow over Horseshoe Falls, which is this part of Niagara Falls, is about 0.0064 sphere drops. So hopefully that gives you a sense of how much water we're talking about. Additionally, the water coming through the Bering Strait from the Pacific to the Arctic, it's warmer. So the Bering Strait is responsible for transporting heat to the Arctic. Uh, this figure is just some modeling results. So the colorful lines, those are models of the Bering Strait and these black lines or black dots are observations. Most fresh water transported to the Arctic comes through the Bering Strait, okay? So um, the water in the north part of the Pacific is pretty fresh because of all the melting glaciers. So actually, even compared to uh, the water coming in from the Atlantic, most fresh water transported to the Arctic is coming through the Bering Strait. So our premise for this project, the oceans transport heat. Oceans, uh, ocean circulation is fundamental to climate for that reason, okay? Uh, heat is transported around the planet. If you change ocean circulation, you change how heat is transported, which must change climate. And we're talking about global climate. The Bering Strait is the only connection between the Pacific and the Arctic Oceans. And for that reason, the amount of water that flows through the Bering Strait, that can get through the Bering Strait, let it be none, as much as there is now a sphere drop or anywhere in between, has really significant consequences for global climate. Heat and salinity, the temperature and the freshness of water in the Arctic really depends on the Bering Strait. But complicating, throughout Earth's history, sea level has risen and fallen. So this connection between the Pacific and the Arctic has closed. So this is our question. How does the depth of the Bering Strait impact flow through it? Okay, let's look at that. How does the depth of the Bering Strait impact flow through it? Let's try to just use the power of our minds to figure this out. If the Bering Strait is more open, more water is going to get through it. That makes sense, right? You have a deeper channel, you can get more water through it. But what exactly does that mean? Um, how does this functional relationship work? Uh, to illuminate that question, I'm going to have you think about a garden hose. If you hold a garden hose and you don't put your thumb anywhere near it, some amount of water comes out. If you put your thumb over the end of the garden hose, you can stop the water coming out of it. You can totally close the garden hose. But if you put your thumb halfway over the garden hose, about the same amount of water comes out. It's coming out at a higher pressure. It's more 
water over a smaller area, or it's the same amount of water over a smaller area, but you're getting about the same amount of water. So at what point does that change happen? At what point do you start letting less water out of the garden hose? We need a computer model to figure that out. So this is our tool, a global climate model. So this is an artist's rendition of a global climate model. You have a grid, or we have a grid, for the ocean, land, atmosphere, sometimes ice, they vary. Uh, the ocean and the atmosphere are also likely to have depth to them. So you can look at different levels in the atmosphere and the ocean, which is good news for us. We can do experiments in these models. So these computer models let us perturb climate and see what happens. We have no other way of doing these experiments. We can't just change climate because, as we've learned, that's a dangerous thing to do. So these are very helpful tools. Our global climate model that we're going to be using is called MIT GCM. It's MIT's in-house global climate model. It's a very high resolution model. So for the most part, when we talk about global climate models, we're thinking about uh, grid cells on the size of a degree or two. MIT GCM's grid cells are about 17 kilometers on a, on a side. Uh, it's really computationally intensive for that reason. So there isn't a coupled atmosphere. The model is going to see the same atmosphere every year, no matter what you do, unless you change the atmosphere. So this is what it looks like. Okay, This is the Atlantic Ocean. That's Cape Cod. Um, and this is the Gulf Stream. So you can see how fine scale the grid is in this model. Um, you can really pick out fine scale features of ocean circulation, which is what we need to do for this project. OK, so here's a little video of me running the model to give you a sense. So this is Linux. It looks a little different than your normal computer. These are all files that the model needs to run. OK, we've got latitude, we've got X grid, Y grid. Um, I'm going to open a file. Um, this lets me turn off certain packages. I don't want to use icebergs in this simulation, so I'm saying no icebergs, false. And now I'm going to close the file. Close the file. <laughs> OK, there we go. Um, and then I'm going to look back through my files. Um, that's the actual model right there, MIT GCM. That's the executable for running the file. Um, I'm going to scroll back through. I'm deleting that because that's for icebergs. And then we're going to take a look. Everything looks in order. There's some depth data. Good to know that's there. Uh, so on and so forth. I wish I had done this faster, but here we are. OK, so now we're going to scroll back down. And now I'm going to run the file, or run the model. So I run this model on multiple processors. I'm going to use eight here. Um, and then I type it in, press Enter eventually. There we go. Um, and then we look at my computer. We take a look at my CPUs, my processors, and you can see we're really cooking now. We're working really hard to run this model. Okay, So I show you this to just demystify. And then I go and I get a cup of coffee because it's going to take days to run it. Okay, So that is running the model. Okay, um, What is actually happening? This is the domain of our model. We're using actually only the Arctic because we're only interested in the Arctic. Anything south of this colorful square doesn't exist as far as the model is concerned. Um, this, the colors here have to do with depth. So yellow is shallower, blue is deeper, the land is yellow, the ocean is purpley, purpley blue. So I just said that. The rest of the model or planet doesn't exist. This is what uh, that looks like in terms of ocean circulation. So now yellow is faster running water or faster moving water. Purple is slower moving water. Um, we need to run the model for a little bit for ocean currents to stabilize. So as we run this, you can see the Greenland current is gaining strength and it's becoming more discrete. Uh, I have to run it actually for about 10 years to stabilize. So this is really just the beginning. But Look specifically down here. So this is our Bering Strait, and you can see a really fast current developing there. Okay, That is our flow from the Pacific into the Arctic. A zoom in on that. Better look. So this has arrows, so you can see which way surface water is flowing. You have to take my word for it. It's going north. It doesn't look like it is, but I promise it is. 
And importantly, we only have about six grid cells across the strait. That's fine. That's plenty for what we're doing. Another important aspect of this is we have ice in our model. Um, the model determines whether or not the ocean should freeze. Uh, blue here is thicker ice, white is thinner ice, and you can see it seasonally advances and then retreats as spring sets on. Okay, so this is back to topography, bathymetry. Uh, yellow is shallower, purple is deeper. That's the land, Alaska, that's Siberia. Here is the channel, that's the Bering Strait. Our goal is to close this by different amounts. We're gonna make it shallower. We're gonna make it all the way open. We're gonna make it all the way closed. And we're gonna run some experiments with it only partially open. This is really easy to do as it turns out, okay? Editing the topography of this model is as simple as opening a file and changing, adding however much topography you wanna add. It's a little harder than that, but by and large. So this is what that looks like. These are just three experiments. So this is all the way open here. You can see it's deeper. This is all the way closed. And then this is a halfway. So here, 52 meters deep. Here, zero meters deep. Here, it's about 20 meters deep. If it helps to look at it in three dimensions, that's what it looks like, okay? This is our fully open straight. It's exaggerated vertically, but you can see plenty of space for water to get through less space for water to get through, no space for water to get through. It's just land. A caveat to this is that we have 17 meters horizontal resolution, but we have only 10 meters, or we have 10 meters of vertical resolution. So we can only actually have five possible depths when we close the strait. This is a limitation. It's fine. It's as good as it's going to get. Okay, so here are some results. What I am about to show you this is 400 simulated days average. We're changing the depth of the strait. We're not changing anything else. We're just making the strait shallower or deeper. So here, this is how deep the strait is. Here, this is how much water is getting through. We start with a fully open bearing strait. We get about a fair drop of water going through it. Great, looks like reality. That's what we want. That's why we run this. Now we're gonna close it by half, okay? So we're gonna add 30 meters or so of land to the bottom of the strait. So it'll only be about, well, actually, no, we're gonna add about 25. It's gonna be about 30 meters deep, okay? <laughs> it's hard to think about it. Okay, so that's what it looks like, actually. If the Bering Strait is about 30 meters deep, the flow basically doesn't change through it at all, okay? You can make the Bering Strait quite a bit shallower without changing the amount of flow through it. This was surprising to me. I didn't really expect this. I don't know what I expected, but I was worried I did something wrong, but I didn't. The next thing I'm gonna show you is uh, a bearing straight that's a bit less than 15 meters deep, so about 10 meters deep. Very shallow bearing straight. That looks like this. If the bearing straight is 10 meters deep, no water gets through it, essentially. So this is really the critical area, okay? What we want to figure out is what this looks like. At what point does water stop flowing through the Bering Strait? We know now it's between about 10 and 25 meters, but we don't know where that critical point is. So you could imagine a couple different situations, okay? It could look like this, you know? Uh, the, the transition from open to close happens pretty quickly after 25 meters deep, but it happens kind of gradually. You could also imagine this, um, that the strait sort of slowly or it allows less and less water, staying close to a sphere drop, but then quickly drops off as it gets quite shallow. These are two very different stories in two very different climate situations. When we're thinking about Earth history and we're thinking about sea level, like I said, we want to know how much water is making it through the Bering Strait. That's really important for interpreting climate. So these two results have a really different implication for a Bering Strait that's, say, 17 meters deep. In this situation, a 17 meter deep Bering Strait still lets a lot of water through. In this situation, not as much as getting through. Those are two, different, two very different stories. So this is what we want to know. 
We want to figure this out. And when I made these slides earlier this week, I didn't have an answer for you. I was going to leave this here as a next step. But yesterday, in my coding for Earth Science class, we ran this model, and we got a result, which I will now show you. OK. That's what it looks like. I actually gasped when this figure popped up. Um, this transition is happening quite quickly here, OK? We have now a much narrower range, narrower range for how much water or for this drop off between of water flow through the Bering Strait. OK, so we have a lot of confidence about this point that there is where the drop off starts to happen. Um, you'll notice there is actually a bit of a different form for the more open straits. That's because I'm averaging less data here. So this is a preliminary result, but it's likely to hold up, I think. So, as I said, a Bering Strait that's about 20 meters lower than modern doesn't have a significantly different flow through it. Okay, We can think about that connection between the Pacific and the Arctic Ocean about the same way. Any lower than that, though, you have an abrupt change in sea level, and so you have an abrupt change in ocean circulation, and so you have an abrupt change in climate, likely. So. That's where I'll leave it. This is my conclusion. But I have a couple next steps. I'd like to unravel these dots. As I said, we have about a year of data within each of those dots. It'd be interesting to look at the seasonality of the flow. Also temperature, salinity. How do those things change with the flux? So those two factors, how much heat is making it through the Bering Strait and how much salt is making it through the Bering Strait, are actually quite a bit more important. And then also, and I believe this is probably much of the story, What's the role of ice in this? So how does sea ice contribute to this? Um, yeah, and so with that, I'm gonna thank my collaborators, Jesse Farmer at UMass Boston, um, my Geology 200 class who helped me yesterday, and then these are some references for you. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah. Have you done the as a function not just of the volume size, but the amount of uh, interplaces between the land and the water. Uh, so can you can you rephrase that? I didn't totally understand. Um, supposing some of it's due to sort of um, swirling because of the surface. Yes. Yeah. OK. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, that's one of my next steps. And I'll change uh, this. I'll go back a bit. Um, I think this is likely to be a part of this, because though um, you're changing the depth by a set amount, the topography is actually changing by quite a bit in terms of its roughness and in terms of the significance of these islands. So yeah, that's the thing that I, I want to do for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so it has to, right? Because uh, time is a part of this unit of sphere drops. It's uh, volume per second. So it's a good analogy because it's a higher pressure flow going through the strait, or that's what I think is happening. So definitely. Um, and then you had a, a point also about salinity. The first was about um, uh, the salinity of, of the water, because I understand that fresh water is denser, heavier, so it falls to a depth which is different from salinity that has a tendency to be more buoyant. Yeah, so um, that has a lot to do actually with this. Uh, excuse me, hold on. Do, do, do. Like this. So um, going through the Bering Strait, it's probably pretty mixed because of how shallow it is. So you're taking a pretty big reservoir of water in the Pacific and you're channeling it through a smaller area. So in terms of the Bering Strait itself, it's probably pretty mixed in there. But heading into the Arctic, that's part of why this is so important, because this water is pretty fresh. It's getting a lot of runoff from Alaska and melting glaciers there. 
So this relatively fresh water is going to have significant consequences for the flow in the Arctic. So that's part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so AMOC is slowing down. The model, previous modeling of this strait has found that if you shut the Bering Strait, shut the Bering Strait, you strengthen AMOC. Um, it has to do with your making a greater uh, gradient from the Arctic to uh, the equator, basically. So you're, you're having a less well-mixed Arctic because you're not getting that fresh water. So the, uh, the Atlantic gets hotter and the Pacific gets colder. There's a lot more, it's a lot more of a complicated story than that, but spark notes, that's what it is. Is that good or bad? Uh, it's bad for climate to change abruptly in any direction. Yeah. Are Yeah, so specifically for wind, uh, wind is not something we can really get at in this model because the atmosphere is set. Um, we can sort of peel it apart by looking at what our forcing is, but it, it'll take the more modeling, basically, to answer that question. If you shut the Bering Strait, you get a lot more ice and snow in the Arctic. The Arctic gets colder. So um, you would expect wind to have less of an impact on the flow there. But I think, well, I'm, I shouldn't think. Yeah, I'll end my answer there. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that, actually. Yeah, so I will say that m historically my research has been about the North Atlantic Basin, and this is my first foray out of it. I have a pretty good handle on what's going on with the Bering Strait, but I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how it compares. Probably similar. Yeah. What is the geopolitical control of the Bering Strait? Oh, okay. So I looked this up yesterday. This is out of my area of expertise, but I'll say what I can, which is that these islands are part of the U.S., okay? Uh, so they're governed by the U.S., and then uh, this part, I believe, approaching Russia becomes Russia. Um, I don't know where the line is, and uh, I don't know who decides what happens there. Yeah. yeah. Do you use the same initial conditions when you spin up the model, or for the variance, or do you get a different control down on that? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, for reasons of not having years to do this, I spin up the model using always an open bearing straight, and then I close, I start from that point and I close the bearing straight and I let it run to a semblance of an equilibrium. I think that's pretty, a, pretty much a fine thing to do. That's actually an approximation of what would happen if you close the bearing straight, so yeah. Connor. Uh, so this is all looking at closing the bearing straight, um, but yeah. if the ice is running and melting, it's not good to warm close the bearing straight yeah, cool. Yeah, so that, I was thinking about that just today. Um, that is a simulation that I have planned, um, which is that, uh, so part of this is that the 2300 projected sea level rise is about four meters, okay? So that, and that's the worst case scenario as projected. So we can run another simulation, and I think we should, that is, sorry, getting to the slide, um, that is up here somewhere, or over here somewhere. Um, it doesn't get us very far because we're not expecting, you know, 10 meters of sea level rise by 2300. Um, should those updates change or, or should those projections change? Much more interesting question. But yeah, I will do that.
Yeah. Rain. Are there lessons to get involved with the online and filling that curve more completely, or is that something we can do right now? Yeah, so there are many different global climate models. Um, this is on the higher resolution end. So this is approaching as good as it gets. There are models that are not, that are more regional. They're just of, say, the Bering Strait, um, where you could perhaps ask this question at higher resolution, but in a less sophisticated way. So if you do that, you don't get to think about Arctic circulation and its role in this. So it's a cost benefit, but I know this model well, and it works well. So, yeah. Andy. What type of yeah, uh, more is always better. Um, the Arctic configuration that I'm running, I can run it on my laptop. I have a pretty big laptop. So I use 12, I use eight processors and it takes about a week, a week to run maybe five, 10 years. Um, for my PhD work, I needed a global version of this model, and I was using icebergs, which are computationally intensive. So I, use, I needed to run this on a supercomputer. I would run it on 216 processors, and it would take a week to run 10 years. So ideally, we would do this in a global climate model, uh, or like in a global configuration, but my laptop would melt, and it would take my whole life. So... <laughs> Well, if you have any questions uh, or any questions, I'll be here. Thank you very much.